This is the Azrock Steel Legend Z390. The Legend of Steel. The Steely Dan and the VRM band. Maybe the Azrock band. <sighs> it's another motherboard. We've got to get through this. I was worried about this one. But let's take a look. <laughs> A lot of people think that Z390 isn't the most exciting because, well, it's been there and done that. It's basically a third iteration of a tried and true chipset that now finally supports 10 gigabit USB. And what is there really to be excited about that? I mean, it's, it's pedestrian, it's mainstream. We're not going to the moon, but look, this may shock you, but some people out there are buying systems because they want stability. They want predictability. They want, you know, the thing that's Intel, basically. And this is a cost down option for Z390. You'd buy Z390 because you want at least some overclocking and some tinkerability. And Intel's kind of in a weird position because there's overclocking and then there's overclocking. And we've got this weird place where this CPU, a 9900K, runs fine at five gigahertz all core as long as you can keep it cool. And that's, that's kind of an odd place to be. I mean, the max turbo frequency on any given core is five gigahertz. That's the spec from Intel. It's just that Intel doesn't want you to run all the cores at five gigahertz, but any individual core is stable at five gigahertz. So, you know, because when you're running a program, it doesn't migrate to the fastest core. It means that all cores have to be capable of five gigahertz, though not necessarily at the same time. And the not necessarily at the same time is really down to power delivery or heat dissipation. And that's what I was worried about on this board. But we can take a deeper look. So the power setup here, I think is a six plus two configuration with 60 amp chokes. It's decent though. And they're using pretty decent components to get there. The 9900K, this CPU is a 95 watt TDP part, but every 9900K I've ever put my hands on is going to consume about 150 to 165 watts. And yes, TDP is not necessarily power consumed. It's not what we're talking about. Uh, we can get into the physics of it, but the VRM can deliver the wattage that this processor requires, which is quite a bit over 95 watts in a worst case scenario, especially at a five gigahertz all core overclock. So the answer is yes. It has a single eight pin CPU power connector, which, you know, 375 to 400 watts at the top end is what that can deliver. So, you know, 150, 165 watts to the CPU plus the PCIe bus, not a problem. You shouldn't be expecting an extreme all core overclock or even really an extreme overclock because you just shouldn't. But you will see stability at five gigahertz to 5.1 gigahertz unless your CPU demands a lot of voltage to get to stability uh, past five gigahertz. But I think 5.1 gigahertz, I mean, it is technically a bit of an overclock. It's potential instability. I guess what I'm saying is that even though five gigahertz all core is technically a little bit of an overclock, I don't like leaving performance on the table because the CPU can do it, each core individually can do it. It's just a question of can they all do it together and be stable? And as long as you have decent cooling, in my experience on a 9900K, yes, you can. And that's perfectly reasonable because you know, you want stability. So it's a little bit of an overclock C390. I don't know, it's a weird place. It's a weird argument that I'm making here. But if you're watching this in Q4 of 2019, Intel just released the 9900KS, which is the 9900K, but five gigahertz all core is guaranteed, actually guaranteed by Intel. Really, the way that I think of it and the way that you should think of it is not being a chump leaving performance on the table because you should be able to do five gigahertz all core on your 9900K with just the tiniest little bit of fiddling. Basically, anybody should be able to do that. And if you paid what you paid for the 9900K and the Z390 chipset, well, you should get that performance. Now, of course, this motherboard would be a good fit for the i5 or other nine series overclockable parts. Those are the K series parts, sure. I mean, you know, if it can do the eight core, then the i5 is not gonna be a problem. The i7 has, you know, eight cores, but no hyper threading. Also, not really a problem, but for cost down, what else has been trimmed? Well, a bit actually. First, the rear I.O. Let's talk about the rear I.O. and what's going on back there. I think what's going on in the back door of the motherboard. You have two five gigabit USB 3 ports and two USB 3 
uh, 10 gigabit ports, one type A and one type C. And there are two USB 2 ports, USB 2.0. So you have a combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port and an optional antenna connections and a Realtek ALC 1200 7.1 audio solution, but with optical SPDIF out. The audio solution is a bit scaled back, especially with the analog mic preamp or the, the amplifier for the analog microphone. But, you know, if you've got a USB headset, uh, this is not gonna be a problem for you. I'm not an audiophile, but it sounded fine to me on my, you know, my headphones, my Bose headphones, which are uh, something somebody gave me because they, it was a gift, so thank you. But the headphones seem like they're pretty good. You do have DisplayPort and HDMI on the back. If you've got an iGPU, if you've got a CPU that has a built-in GPU, in other words. Uh, you've also got Intel Gigabit LAN, which is the right choice, I think. I mean, you do sacrifice a, a few USB ports here, but if you need more USB ports or more connectivity at the back here, trade up to another model that costs a little more. Now, the optional antenna connections here, um, they're... I mean, it's, it's, a, it's designed for a two by two connection. You could do a three by three, but this motherboard also has an onboard E-Key M.2, which also supports the CNVI wireless card standard. So CNVI is sort of a new uh, interface that is a little less uh, hardware overhead or a little less hardware cost. So you, theoretically, you should be able to get the CNVI connections. So there you go. Now the PCIe layout is another difference here. This top primary X16 slot is wired directly into the CPU and that's it. There's no by eight by eight option. This other slot that is physically by 16 is actually electrically by four and the PCIe lanes are routed through the chipset. So remember that all of the PCIe lanes that are not directly into the CPU are routed through a PCI Express by four connection. So all of the other PCI Express ports on here and the M.2 slots are routed through the chipset, which in total only has a PCI Express by four connection to the CPU. That will work fine for, you know, a high-speed PCIe capture card or a secondary NVMe carrier or something like that, but it would not work fine if you wanted to run, say, uh, SLI graphics. Now, Crossfire, I guess, would technically work, but you've got a little bit of a bottleneck there. So, I mean, it, you would have a little bit of a bottleneck if you were using two really high-performance NVMe drives. It's really really designed for one and maybe some other relatively low speed peripherals you could do an add-in sound card something like that the motherboard also has one extra usb 2 header and two extra 5 gigabit usb 3 headers no type c which you wouldn't really expect on a cost down motherboard if your case does not have usb headers or usb breakouts to use all the usb headers on the motherboard you can buy a usb header that'll give you the usb ports at the back of your case uh, on an expansion slot and that'll give you you know access to the usb ports that are available on the motherboard that but that don't physically have the connector if for example your case only has two front usb 3 ports you could pull out the usb 2 ports and the usb 3 ports through one of those cables at the back of the motherboard not a problem it also has a thunderbolt header so you can add a thunderbolt add-in card and get that up and running on this platform so that's nice also provides addressable rgb you know the digital rgb strips and an analog 5050 rgb header control is via the asrock polychrome software of course which is which is windows or if you're on linux there is an option you can configure polychrome directly in the uefi so if you're the unusual combination of a user who wants to run linux and also really wants their rgb you can do it through the uefi speaking of linux Linux works great on this motherboard. You can run VFIO with the iGPU on the host and an add-in graphics card for the guest. Uh, but you know, Z390 isn't great, isn't a great choice for the VFIO option. Although for a Linux workstation, this is a perfectly fine option. If you want a really zippy 9900K, again, with the all core five gigahertz overclock, you could do that in the BIOS and it'll work just great in Linux. Get five gigahertz on all eight cores, makes a pretty great workstation. Now I will give you one last note and that's the VRM area. It, you will need pretty good airflow over the VRM. Now, if you're using an all-in-one cooler like I was, make sure that you've got good airflow because the VRMs will easily reach 90 degrees C and extended synthetic benchmarks. Now, this motherboard will also work great with eighth gen CPUs like the you know 8600K, the 8086, and that is not going to be pushing nearly as much wattage because it's six cores instead of eight. I happen to have an 8086K anniversary edition. I had no problem reaching 5.2 gigahertz on all cores with the overclock. Now again, 
five gigahertz, that's the easy button, that's stable. That's not leaving any performance on the table. You take your stability into your own hands past five gigahertz, I think, but it's a great value. I really, they didn't cut everything to the bone. Uh, you know, for the Intel platform, if you want overclocking, you need Z390. The 9900K will pretty reliably hit five gigahertz all core. If you have a 9900K and you're not hitting five gigahertz, I wanna hear from you in the forum at level one because that's weird we'll figure it out. Now lower cost competing boards tend to skip the Intel NIC or go with a lower cost audio codec like the Realtek 892C or do both of those things. This has got an Intel NIC and it's got the uh, Realtek ALC 1200 based audio codec. Now the VRM isn't overbuilt, it's adequate if a little Spartan, but this combination makes a uh, cost down motherboard that still gives you some overclockability and some overclocking options and the ability to reach five gigahertz even on the 9900K and I'm pretty sure 99.9% .9 sure the KS. When I first got this board, I ran into a couple issues, but an updated BIOS fixed that for me. So thanks ASRock for the help. Don't be surprised if you see more about this board and a build that I've got coming up. So, uh, I mean, what else am I going to test? The new 9900 KS, 5 gigahertz out of the box, all core. Woo woo, something. I got, I mean, I got I need something to test it in, right? Also, this motherboard is shockingly light. Like, it doesn't, it's really thin. And it doesn't weigh anything. It's just, it's very, it's shockingly light. If you pick this board up, uh, you would think so too. But if you pick this board up, let me know what your experiences are. Take some pics, show off the rig, level one. I'm Wendell. This is level one, by the way. If you're new here, welcome. I'm going to go hang out in the level one forums now, probably, possibly, sometime. All right, I'm getting out of here. See ya.